say is really happy to welcome you to this conversation. I expect we'll have some more folks popping in as uh, the minutes tick by, but in order to respect everybody's time, I'd love to go ahead and get started. Um, we are very happy to present another issue in our ongoing Authors Talk series, and tonight we are focusing on Cornerstones, Sacred Stories of LGBTQ people who work for Catholic institutions. I know I got the title, employees, LGBTQ employees in Catholic institutions, uh, which is compiled and edited by Mark Guevara and Ish Ruiz, uh, who will both be speaking tonight. And we're also really happy that Terry Gonda, uh, one of the folks whose story is told in the book, um, is here tonight to share some of her story as well. Um, we really want this to be interactive, so uh, please think of questions. I hope some of you have actually had a chance to read the book, and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. So I think um, Mark and Ish may be familiar to both of, to those of you who are joining you. Um, Ish is now at the Pacific School of Religion as just assistant professor of Latinx and queer doctrinal theology. Uh, he got his PhD at the Graduate Theological Union and has also taught at Emory and at University of Dayton. And he just had another book come out as well, uh, LGBTQ plus educators in Catholic schools, embracing synodality, inclusivity, and justice. So congratulations to you, Ish. And Mark is currently a doctoral candidate at the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, um, working on restorative justice issues in the Catholic church and how they can apply to LGBTQ plus folks, something I think we'll also be learning more about as time goes on from you, Mark. Um, he is, his story is also included in this book because as along with being uh, an editor and a compiler of the book, he uh, was fired from his role uh, as a pastoral minister because he was in a same sex relationship. So he's kind of wearing two hats there. Um, and Terry will tell a bit of her story about being fired as a music minister in a parish in the Archdiocese of Detroit and her remarkable story um, of trying to continue on as a member of that community and doing that over the course of many years. So um, thank you all for being here and for this book, which I think is a really important resource. Um, many folks, you know, I mean, the issue of LGBTQ people uh, having difficulties in working for, in Catholic institutions um, is an issue that I know Dignity USA has been working on for at least 50 years. We actually found letters um, in our archives going back to a, a situation in 1974 where one of our members in the Los Angeles area was fired by a Catholic school run by a religious order um, he had been a teacher and a coach, and there were fears that uh, because he was gay, that he was also be a pederast. Um, no accusations. It was it was just fears, and there's a whole series of letters documenting efforts to get him his job back and all of that. So, you know, this is an issue that's been going on for decades, um, probably even earlier than that. Um, but this book, I think, is a great resource because it documents these stories in a very compelling way by having the impacted individuals be able to speak for themselves and to tell their stories, not in the media spotlight, not shaped by the voices of journalists with or without an agenda, and not in the moment. There's a, a real opportunity to kind of get the sense of impact of the story on their lives and on their communities and on their faith. And I think that's a really important resource. Um, I also, Ish and Mark, really want to thank you for choosing to have questions for reflection at the end of each, at the end of each story, there's a page that offers three or four 
different questions for reflection. And I think that's just such a great way to get us to engage more deeply with these stories, with the individuals impacted, with our church, with the issues um, that the book presents. And I, I just thought that that was such a brilliant strategy for this book. So um, having expressed a little appreciation for it, I guess I'd just like to ask you, Ish and Mark, what was the inspiration for this book? How did it come to be? Why did you choose to put your talents and your limited time, given all the other things you work on, to bringing this to fruit? Thank you. Um, I can start here. Uh, thank you for having us. Hello, everybody. Um, you know, Mark approached me with the book. It was actually Mark's baby. This was his idea. He said, how about we start uh, compiling this? The most pressing um, event that led to us thinking about the book was the Synod on Synodality. Um, the idea originally was to put a copy in each bishop's hand before they went to the Synod. And, um, you know, I, I, I am a scholar of synodality. I do in my efforts to promote racial and LGBTQ plus justice in the church. Um, I just can't help but to describe more inclusion in Catholicism through a path, an ecclesiology of listening, an ecclesiology of being together with each other, of journeying together, even through uncertainty. It is hard for me to imagine any other path forward for this church um, than a synodal path, right? And so I am a promoter of that. So this book, in light of the synodal journey of the church, this book is an attempt really to model what synodality could potentially look like by offering an avenue for listening and conversation um, on on this controversial topic, uh, I I I will let Mark share his story. Um, I I'm one of those teachers that didn't get fired. I was a high school teacher for eleven years, um, and you know it was one of those things where everybody kind of knew. It's what Brian Massingill taught calls the open closet, where the door is open and everyone kind of knows who's queer. And I was there was certainly my case. There were rainbows, unicorns. Uh, and everything you can, all sorts of LGBT paraphernalia in my classroom. Um, but I was never necessarily like, hi, my name is Mr. Ruiz, I'm gay. Um, so they, I was able to get, get by with that. I moderated an LGBT club, but I remember I was always scared. It was always a fear. Um, I remember my first, uh, in, my, in my book that I authored, um, I opened up with this story of like two weeks into my first job as a teacher, I was put called to the principal's office. Uh, because a student took a picture of me coming out of a gay bar and it was circling around. Um, and that kind of fear, I feel it in my temples, you know, like as if you were pressing and every year it, it feels stronger and stronger, the anxiety that my love for another person, because that's when the anxiety would get worse is when I was dating someone, um, that my love for someone else could be the cause for my firing, which is not just losing a job, although it certainly is that, but it's also a threat to my vocation, my calling, my sense of purpose. So um, very interested. I've always been interested in this kind of research. Uh, and when Mark offered the opportunity and said, here's a plan, New Ways Ministry is on board. Um, shall we do it? I was very much like, yes, let's let's go ahead. Um, and I'll I'll stop talking there. I'll send it over, I'll toss it over to Mark. That's really great. I just also want to extend a thank you. Uh, to all of you for being here. I uh, Greetings from Edmonton, Canada. I am a Canadian, um, but it's so great to, to be in the Dignity family. Um, I, I, I rarely tell this story, but when I was uh, on my fourth year of university, my last year, I decided to go to my first Pride Parade in Vancouver. And I was like, you know, screw it. My parents might see me on the news. I, I want to go. So I get there and I bring two friends and down the street comes this huge rainbow dove <laughs> and these men, mostly men, with t-shirts that say, gay and Catholic, intrinsically good, Dignity Vancouver. And I'm like, who are these people? <laughs> and so I had graduated from my undergrad, moved to Toronto, and there was a group in Toronto, a Dignity group that was meeting at the Jesuit parish. and just they were they were the my supporters and I think I, I mentioned this story because you know as I continued to work in the church and learn and about theology 
uh, I never severed my connection with dignity. They were my home. They were my family outside of the, you know, I, I knew what it was like to be on the margins because dignity was literally there. And so I, I was nice to be able to have that family. And so uh, two weeks ago when I was in Toronto I, for a book presentation, Dignity Toronto uh, had co-hosted the event and celebrated their 50th anniversary. So I was really, really happy to, uh, to be part of that and to celebrate with them. But yeah, it, all of this is, you know, I, I, my, one of my members on my committee is Massimo Fagioli who sees you know, these things within the broader historical picture of our Christian history. And here we are, and here we are presenting these voices. And the Holy Spirit continues to speak through all of us, through um, these voices. And it's such a gift <laughs> that, was it last week or the week before, um, New Way's ministry managed to get this book into the hands of Pope Francis, who said he was intrigued, and is uh, excited to read uh, the book. Um, so yeah, fundamentally, this is part of what it means to be synodal. And I know that as Dignity folks, we've been living that out for, for in different ways for such a long time. And, and it's something to celebrate as part of our continuing story as Christians to bring about liberation and salvation for all God's people. Absolutely. And congratulations. I think the more resources like this that Pope Francis and other church leaders can get their hands on and that they actually read it and absorb it and understand the messages here, you know, hear the location language in here, hear the community language that is here, you know, see what people have been willing to endure um, and grow from because of their love of the church and their love of God and the love of the people of God. Um, it's really important. So really glad that's now in his library and hopefully, you know, he's sitting there in his white t-shirt reading very carefully. Um, so that's great. Um, Terry, I'd like to ask you why you decided to answer the call of telling your story. Um, in a way that it hadn't been heard before and what opportunities you saw this book presenting and and also i guess whether there was any resistance to telling the story again from your perspective you're still muted terry <laughs> okay i'm old i admit it um i echo Mark and Ish said I, what they articulated so well. My story felt so powerful to me. I mean, it was if you, you know if you read the story, it's not one of of despair. It's one of God is amazing. It's one of amazing things, and so man, I'm compelled to talk about it. Um, I did a mini version for the IHMs, um, which was a good a good start. And then when asked, uh, gosh, I just felt, you know, driven to yes, yes, yes. And knowing the therapy and, and everything, the, the deepening that the telling of it would do to me, impact on me. So uh, no real resistance at all, more excitement of how do I talk about this? It just, it's, it's crazy. It's messy. There's so much going on. And that's why it's, you know, 400 pages long in the book. <laughs> But these guys were so supportive, um, just beautiful. So no real, uh, no real resistance. More joy and compelled and, and driven to to speak. Yeah, I know. Thank you. And um, you know, very quickly, the outlines of the. I think the outlines of the story that people know are that you know shortly before your contract was about to be up anyhow and there could have been renewal and during a time of transition in leadership in your parish a parish that you and your partners then wife christy um was also doing music mu music ministry in you were fired um by the incoming priest um 
and decided to stay with the parish and to continue to be part of the community there to engage uh, the incoming priest in conversation and you know in journey you continue to journey with the community with the priest with the pastor with the music ministry in some ways so i think those are the pieces that people may have heard right if they followed your story in the media but the story you really talk about what it has taken for you and for christy to um, continue on in that parish and in relationship with that priest and how you see God working in that. So can you go into that a little bit for us? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it's even more convoluted <laughs> than you described because I expected the priest was going to fire me. And we, we found out at an Ash Wednesday, you know, you know, in, in the beginning of Lent, we find out and it's July that it happens. So at all of, all of Lent to pray, and I had already, in January, started to to be given this prayer, um, which is why I say God prepared me for this. So the the backdrop to to those details is that I was in a a unique situation, as I wasn't just hijacked to be fired. I'd been preparing for it, not just like these guys have said all my life, right? You know, once I knew I was married for sure, but um, God was helping me manage how I saw myself and how I saw myself in the world. And I had this prayer of moving from victim of things being done to me. That's that sense of we're victims of this world to being Christ and the, the energy outward, which is very much the gospel, right? You know, love your enemies, put, you know, give that energy outward and you'll be transformed. And so I was praying like this for, for three months before we heard this new priest was going to come in and I just knew he was going to fire me. So I started to do the gospel, pray for your enemies, praying for the archbishop who was doing this, praying for this priest and ranting and, and pacing as COVID hit <laughs> and uh, something weird happened in the middle of praying for Father Dan, the new guy coming in. There was a moment where I felt this warm wash of love flow through me and I got my attention. I now know. I was filled with grace at that moment. So I'm here to say the gospel is very self-serving. <laughs> You're praying for your enemies and you, you know, I was transformed in that moment. And that grace carried me through that story. So the two weeks before, when my priest said, it was my current pastor that said, the archdiocese wants to fire you. So not my priest, not the incoming priest, so nobody whose job it was to manage me <laughs> was making this decision. The archdiocese decided that they were probably going to help the new guy out. Maybe Mike, clean up your mess, you know, my current priest. And so why I, I, I say such an amazing story is that how does your worst nightmare happen? I've been there 36 years from college onward. They had raised me. They were the epitome of a synodal parish, you know, helped me train as a spiritual director, went through the spiritual exercises, helped heal some of that gay shame. They embraced Kirsty and I, nine years long distance, and, and, and supported us even in our marriage. All these 36 years. How does your worst nightmare happen? The archdiocese is going to fire you. And you get the message and you go, huh. That's two weeks early. That was the impact of the prayer. That's what God did for me in my story. And it's because I said, I'm a, I'm a Catholic, a lesbian, an engineer, an artist, a pacifist who works for the army. I've, I've been conditioned to sit in the mess and to choose a mystic theology as an identity of one in God and to, to come from that story, which means I'm one with everyone else. And that story, and then learning to sit with the mess, that combination of just doing that a lot and failing, but just keep practicing it, of thinking oneness, 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 unconditional love, and I got to give it out and give it in and give it out, and, and staying in that mess all the time, 
it, it formed me so that by the time that happens that's who I am that's why my story is different I mean it's all of that came in embraced by a community having mystic theology which created an identity for me of I'm one and there's nothing I can do to screw that up it just it's mystic reality it's what it is but that also means I'm one with you and with that archbishop and with this new father Dan and so I just had to keep practicing that and so when I, I I make the statement I make it to the free press and by then Christy and I were clear it's just like I'm going to try and stand in my dignity but Father Martin says this bridge has two ends to it I have to also then embrace the dignity of the people on the other side of the bridge and so we said we know we think we know that they believe they were doing the right thing. If I if I really lean into their best intention, they think it's their job to, to save souls. I mean, they're, they're screwed if they're not trying to save souls in their mind. And so this is how they think they're, they're doing this. They're I mean, they're trying to live with integrity. And I don't want their job. You know, I don't want the job of the Archbishop to be having no win, especially in Detroit, of having the, you know, the, the church built yes. at that point, right? So I know they thought they were doing the right thing and it, their job sucks. So we forgive them. And we're going to be in the, we're claiming our dignity. We're going to be next week welcoming the new guy because that's who we are and sitting in the front pew because that's what we do. So claiming our dignity, but giving everybody theirs, assuming best of intent, yes. even if it was done in a shitty way and saying, you know what? There was a better way to fire me, a synodal way to fire me. And all it would have taken was to accompany me like my pastors. Can you imagine? I mean, here, here's the picture. Sitting together, having tea, heard your story, because we did this with one of, one of the priests. And he, he said, you're right. I see that God has the two of you, you know, come together and, and saving lives and all of these things. But I think God means for you to be good friends. <laughs> so the most conservative would be that. And then to say, but Terry, I have a conundrum. I can't hold you up as a leader. People are going to be confused. Help me. I don't know how to handle this. I see your gifts, yeah. but right. That would have been a synodal thing. And then I was ready to do that with the incoming priest in my prayer. That was what we were going to do. And I'd have been happy to find him a new musician if that's where we came to together. So because they interfered, it's I spoke out because that was not synodal. Yeah, it's really, okay. it's really a remarkable story, uh, you know, that you share. And Kirsty, I'm sorry, I apologize for getting your name wrong uh, in the beginning. Oh, thank you for the reminder. Um, you know, and and it does stand out, you know, among so many of the other stories where, you know, either staying in a school or a parish under that cloud of fear <laughs> does harm to people or losing a job being forced out of a job disrupts folks' experience of community and faith. So I don't know if, um, Mark, is you want to speak either, Mark, from your personal experience or out of the context of the book about some of these other kinds of impacts that, that you point out in the book, how this treatment of so many LGBTQ people has an impact um, on so many folks. I mean, even the folks who have to do the firing sometime, as you point out, Terry, you know, it's, it's, oh, why do we put ourselves through this? I love, I love this notion that Terry mentioned about being formed in the mess. Um, yes. And, and I relate to that, but also in that mess, I found groups like Dignity that were, you know, signs of hope and grace and, you know, um, help me carry me through the mess carries still to to this day through the mess um and so when i and you know had the the, the firing and all that happened to me i held firmly onto the communities of faith my own faith my formation my wonderful mm -hmm. formation my spirituality uh to to carry me through it um but it did impact a lot of people as it naturally would um I recall um, getting messages from folks saying that the pastor had, during his homily, mentioned that Mark was fired, um, and and 
people couldn't stand up at the after the homily to profess the creed. They were just in shock. Um, folks left the parish, went to other parishes. Some left the church altogether and went to the local, you know, mainline Protestant inclusive parish. Um, so yeah, there was there was a lot of reverberations throughout. Teachers were talking about it in their staff rooms and students. One of the schools had to bring a bereavement counselor in because it was so difficult for them. I had, you know, very close relationships with the nine Catholic schools that our parish were associated. We have publicly funded Catholic schools in Alberta. And so I was had wonderful relationships with all the principals, teachers, did led retreats with them, led liturgies for the entire schools. And so it's not surprising that when this um, firing happens, that it causes a lot of acrimony. Personally, you know, I still feel the the pain sometimes during anniversaries. There's a scar there. Um, and I, I should also mention that there are many folks who we reached out to who could not tell their story. And, yes. and it's important to also hold that in you know, the tension too. I, I speak about still being at the foot of the cross sometimes. My firing happened during Lent and when I got to Easter, I just could not sing the Easter songs. I could not, through my tears, listen to the exalted with meaning. I was still at the foot of the cross. So yeah, and but thankfully I've had, you know, communities like this, Dignity and and other spiritual directors and other people, my ex-partner was a Presbyterian minister and we had connections with the queer clergy in our city. Um, all around the world got emails from folks, um, long distant relatives that I never knew existed that said, you know, um, I'm a lesbian, uh, your family doesn't know this, but we stand with you and la la la. And so it's just, it's amazing how in the tragedy, there's also grace and hope. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it really is kind of the Christian story, right? The mystery of pain and resurrection happening for many. But as you say, for for so many others, I, I mean, I use the statistic, you know, of of every person that has ever contacted me or Dignity USA you know, to talk about this, one in three goes public with their stories in in recent years and i believe that for every person that talks to me there are probably at least five to ten more who don't you know who yeah. don't know where to turn for help that's or actually, for support yeah that's yes. actually what i was going to share too is you know is uh in my process of writing my book i used these stories it, it took a while to compile these and to edit them so Kind of already had them so i took the liberty of including them in my chapter two um of my text uh but what i also included were stories anonymous stories of folks who uh were not able to go public and when you go public what you do is you uh what i what i think happens this is not perhaps a sociological study in any way but perhaps a, my own perception as someone who's just broadly studied these um these instances is there is a process of giving the community an avenue to voice, to rise up, to organize, to say, um, you know, to say like, we're not okay with this. What happens when a, an, an educator gets fired and does not go public, however, is something much more sinister because it really feeds this concept of shame. And it uh, these educators do not go public for good reasons. Oftentimes they are paid a lot of money in exchange for an NDA and a hush agreement, uh, right? Uh, yes. And let's face it, if you are a young person in a big city, you want to take the money because you can't pay your rent for the next couple of months. If you have children or other other dependents, you want to take the money. So I can't blame them. Um, if you and, have to look for another job, you don't right. want you know, look to be known as, and you yeah. you're gonna you're gonna spend a couple months and and you no longer can say can count on this Catholic school uh as employment history as that you cannot necessarily count on uh on a recommendation letter on a good reference oftentimes you're basically leaving on bad terms quote unquote 
um, even though many of these, I do know that many of these principals who fire still write a good recommendation. And so, but if you don't, if you go public, uh, sorry, if you don't go public, what, what ends up happening is this teacher who is suspected to be gay mysteriously disappears. Okay. And that's shame. And the students pick that up. Um, when what, what what would happen in a in a in a parish is the same thing. Uh, this music minister, very often music minister or pastoral associate or whatever position, who's suspected widely to be gay, their partner comes to uh, to to mass ha or has or something very visible, like a transition, a gender transition is very visible. Okay, uh, so everyone knows, and then they suddenly disappear. People know this, and it's and it feeds this idea of not only is this wrong, it's also wrong to even talk about it, which fuels that sense of shame about sexuality that is so pervasive in our church. So overall, um, this is just devastating. It's it it's that's what it is. Um, the the flip side of this, and I want to piggyback on what Terry talks about and the the grace that's there is that the book does feature some instances of educators and ministers who have been retained by their schools and parishes. And what's interesting there is the beautiful grace that flows through their lives to their communities. Um, the uh, in, in my book, I, I referenced some studies. There are a couple of dissertations that have that have um, that have been published on uh, educators in Catholic schools who have not been fired. And who are pretty out in their schools, and they talk about how LGBTQ plus youth flock to them, how teachers talk to them about justice, how campus ministers rely on their expertise to create a welcoming school, how uh, you know people who work in campus ministry on the so on the on the uh, service immersion side also rely on them. Like uh, LGBTQ plus people have a unique, invaluable perspective to offer their school, their their, their school communities, and their parishes. And we have enough information, or at least the means to study it, um, to say that this is true, that grace flows. And uh, simply stated, uh, to fire an LGBTQ plus person from a Catholic institution is sinful. It is, uh, it is sinful. It is, um, it is depriving that community from God's grace. Right. Simply put. Right. Yeah, very true. I love um the last story in the book kind of ends with somebody who talks about that spirit of, you know, the integration, um, a, a person who is retained by a school and how his ability to be an effective teacher flows out of the fact that that he is able, he's supported in his integration and how wonderful it would be for all of that. Um, before we open it up to other folks who may want to share stories of their own or have other questions for you, I also want to just touch into um, how this the, this issue of LGBTQ employees in Catholic institutions touches not only on, you know, the whole process of synodality as a way of addressing this hierarchical power structure that you know, is just so damaging in so many ways so often, but how it also touches into sort of um, the issues of how uh, faith is represented in the public square sometimes, right? Because we see, you know, um, you talk in the introduction to the book, and it's clearly an issue, this whole question of ministerial exemption, which the Supreme Court has upheld, you know, our church and some other religious institutions are fighting for the right to deny health care based on religious belief, uh, you know, to be able to avoid any kind of non-discrimination laws that have to do with gender and sexuality. And, you know, it, it's kind of an undercurrent in some ways in the book. Um, but yeah, just any thoughts you have about how this issue of employees being fired because of their, because they exercise their legal right to marry a partner <laughs> or because, you know, they undergo a gender transition, um, how that touches into sort of public policy and, and broader um, issues beyond the walls of the church or the school. I can say after my firing, I, uh, I think six or seven, you know, secular news media reached out to me uh, with the assumption that 
my firing was deeply repugnant to the Canadian consciousness and, 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 you know, uh, and, and I know that to be true because we don't have the ministerial exception in Canada. Um, most cases where they, they do have firings, um, the Supreme Court of Canada will most often side with the individual who has been fired. Uh, so I could have uh, fought this all the way to the Supreme Court, although I would have to be on the camera in front of the camera all the time. My family would be in this and I'd have to spend, you know, thousands of dollars, mil maybe even millions. Uh, I do know that uh, the Catholic um, Teachers or the Alberta Teachers Association, of which the Catholic teachers in Alberta are a part of, do have money set aside for fighting this all the way to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they know that one Canadian society, you know, issues like abortion is not an, an issue, <laughs> and and also firing folks of, on the basis of sexual orientation, we've moved on from that as Canadians. I I would say very generally, um, and so there. So there we all need to that. look north for hope. <laughs> yeah, but I, it comes from a unique history, of course, and um, and and I think it's important for us to. Um, you know, realize that there is a public consciousness out there that needs to be shaped by a variety of different stories, including those who, who are Catholic. <laughs> and, and, and the same way, the church needs to listen to that. We can't, this age of synodality means that we can't stay within our thick walls. We have to go out and converse with and find truth and, uh, and, and you know, truth wherever the Holy Spirit um, reveals herself. Great. All right. Um, folks who are, are here, what kinds of questions, comments um, do you have? What would what aspects, what would you like to know about what's in the book? If you've read it, what was your response? You can either use the react button down at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand or just kind of wave. We're a small enough group that we can do that. And then you can unmute yourself and chat. Mark. Love. Good evening, everyone. Um, I joined tonight because I went through this uh, in the 1980s. <clears throat> um, and um, the situation was I was the director of campus ministry for a Catholic high school in the Ar Diocese of Columbus, Ohio. And my partner, my lover, at the time was the super assistant superintendent of the school system. Um, and uh, I moved to Columbus to be with Michael. He was held in very high regard and Liz lived a very closeted life. Um, and given it was in the 1980s, most of us did, um, you know, lived a closeted life. The the uniqueness in the story, my story, I think, is that I was not fired. I took preemptive action um, in um, because a priest of the diocese who worked and lived in the chancery, which means next to the ear of the bishop, um, insinuated that he knew our relationship was more than just a friendship. And in the insinuation was a risk of exposure um, if I didn't comply. Um, that didn't happen, but I decided then and there I had to get out because I couldn't risk bringing disgrace and shame on myself, on the school, and particularly on my love. Um, um, you know, so I had to get out. In the United States, in employment law, that's called constructive dismissal, where the employer creates an, an, a basically untenable environment that makes it impossible for the person to stay. That was kind of the point I wanted to make um, that I don't know if uh, I haven't read the book yet, um, but 
Uh, you've talked about being terminated, which is where the employer takes the action. I wonder how many uh, LGBTQ Catholics did what I did, which was got off the boat before it sank um, sort of thing. And in my story, I also realize there's the historical context of being, you know, nearly 40 years ago when things were very different society in society as well and then you know so my question is i just want to make that kind of point and then kind of get your reaction to it um if you interviewed or spoke with anybody who basically fired themselves before they got fired I do want to go through the summaries because I have brief summaries of everyone's stories and I can't recall just offhand if there was someone with that same uh, scenario. But I did want to say first off, Mark, thank you for sharing your story. Um, uh, I'm not sure how you've processed it through the years and you know if you've had a community to help you um, with that, but you know the, just the act of being vulnerable and sharing that truth, I think uh, should be celebrated. And I thank you for, for that. Thank you. I was blessed with support, and ironically, that support came from a lot of other employees in the school system who knew and loved and respected both of us. It's kind of crazy in a way, but they couldn't publicly support us. The only folks that I know that have left because of the environment prior to being terminated per se are folks who perhaps did not, um, the only ones I know are folks that perhaps did not have a strong commitment um, to the Catholic component of the school. So there were folks that were like an English teacher who were, um, or a social studies teacher that was like, I can be getting paid more elsewhere. Why deal with all this crap? So it was kind of that attitude. Um, not so much, I did not sense in them personally, not so much uh, like that personal, this is the folks that I've encountered, right? I'm sure that there are many others that do experience that, but I did not sense in them that personal hurt over the church has wronged me. This is my community um, because they themselves did not really participate in uh, the Catholic church. Um, the ones that I know who were, you know, who perhaps have a more expressed commitment to the church itself, um, they 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 opted to wait to be fired um but i do know many more who i do know many who i don't think it's somewhere in between what you said and being fired so what you said which is like the employee the employer making creating that toxic environment that pushes you out versus being fired there are there is something in the, between those two which is a soft being fired um, meaning that the employee kind of tells you that they will have to fire you or that the archdiocese knows this will not end well. Would you want to leave on your own accord? Um, uh, it's an informal uh, request to resign. And that's been very popular. And I do know many who have taken that route. Um, and several of them, one of them is, is in this book, is Miguel Ochoa, um, took that route because he really uh, respected the priest and he didn't want the priest to go through having to fire him. Uh, and the priest kind of, you know, called him to his house in tears and said, I, the archdiocese knows that you're married to Jose and they're going to force me to fire you. Um, we could go through all of that and and I am, I'm here or, you know, you could resign. Um, and Miguel, to protect the priest in the community, chose to resign. Um, so that's happened to the soft fire. Um, it, it's all very, it's all very, uh, uh, intense. Uh, something else to point out is that a lot of times these folks who are outed by, you know, who are outed and told to their, who, who whose leadership, uh, are informed that they are queer, um, are often informed. The leadership is often informed by members who are not really part of the community. And that's also something a trend that I've noticed. For example, in Miguel's example and in many other schools' example, these are people who do not necessarily belong to the parish, or are people who are at the parish start you know 
complain and then shortly after they leave so it's it, it's always it's it, another piece uh, a question that's in on my mind as i study this is always like what actually is going through the mind of the people who complain about queer people working there you know um anyhow that's also a question that that comes to me and one of our dear friends went through that very thing in the archdiocese um he was given that up they they were going to fire him and then it kind of got postponed and he he took the he took the break in between to uh to resign um i think it's kind of funny that it never occurred to me and no one ever brought it up that i could have done the same thing and i, I have no idea what i would have done um but but it is interesting that there's sometimes that window to resign Yeah. I think Maybe. something I mentioned in one of the uh one of the pieces that I wrote, I wrote this article on this topic uh a few years ago. This is a very profound vocational and emotional thing, but it's also a profoundly economic and social justice question, right? And we talked about money and we talked a little bit about this. But um uh there there's this interesting conflation that happens with lay ecclesial ministers where you are sort of a minister, you're expected, you know, there's this, this, there's this, uh, there's this atmosphere in our church that says that that almost equates the lay ecclesial minister to a priest, a nun, or a brother, uh, where it's like you're sort of expected to be the self-sacrificial lamb um, that kind of gives themselves to the church in service, right? Um, and often the church does not really consider, so, and so, when we look at these employees, we are simply looking at them in terms of their ability to carry out the process of modeling church teaching. And the church often forgets that it has a, a fiduciary responsibility, an economic justice responsibility toward its own employees um, per their own teachings, uh, right? Uh, and so to me, it's almost like, uh, the the question of how an employee reacts to the impending firing largely depends on their economic standing and what they can so it's a question of what can they how can they afford to react is the question okay and so that's that complicates the 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 reactions that these employees can have because uh a lot of times an employee who who is given a hush deal is it, going to want to take it a lot of times yeah I'm glad you bring that up, that the injustice of that and how people are just victimized. That's where I said I, it wasn't my main job. I had all this background of sitting in the mess. I, uh, I was in a unique position to speak truth to power, with with dignity and to be able to model that and, um, and to be able to say we're going to meet with the new guy coming in and weirdly the guy i thought was going to fire me <laughs> let me stay out as a volunteer and we stayed there and i he let me you know critique his homilies because he was a seminary professor and um clearly something was was off with him we, we meet with him for an hour we literally showed him where the light switch was and showed him to his office and he listened to us he, he knew we were coming and at the end, he said, well, I have to prepare for a homily. If you're sexually active, I ask that you not present yourself for communion. I need to go. <laughs> and we looked at each other. And because, you know, Percy's a therapist, I, you know, psychology has been my life. You know, it wasn't O and a hole. It's like, oh, he's clearly on the spectrum. <laughs> it's like, that is such a low emotional intelligence. You could see like right through it. Gave him some grace because he, he, he did want to listen to us, but that was just so crappy. And uh, I know my, he was a fan of Augustine and, you know, I know my Augustine and no one's standing between me and Jesus, right? <laughs> we see what you are. And so weirdly, mass with Father Dan, during the consecration, I was like laser focused in during those prayers and taking them into me. And then going up to him and having him bless me, sealing that Eucharistic moment each week. I had more intense Eucharistic experiences with Father Dan than ever in my life, because I was really paying attention. Um, that's what this, you know, flipping the story, 
flipping it from, I'm not going to be a victim and, and standing in my truth. But I know that was a privilege for me. And that didn't come from me being great or some saint. It was, it was the whole background, that whole story of having that community and having that kind of spirituality and that training and the mess yeah. that allowed me to do that. And that had an impact on him. You know, by eight months in, he's just, I'm humbled by how the two of you have been handling this. So we impacted him and then he died. He had a blood cancer. So his, there was dementia coming in. Um, yeah. But we, we ended up, now I, I pastor my former Catholic community. <laughs> we, we came and did an intentional community. And to this day right now, I'm the lead pastor of that, of that community. So I tell people, do not feel sorry for me. <laughs> there, was, there was crap and people left the church and people, our people went in different directions. But we created a place for them all to come back to. And I've facilitated synodal sessions around Detroit because that's that's what carried me. I pictured something like that, not knowing the synod was coming. And so four years on, the grace still continues. So we're hurting and still living in the grace and just trying to show up in that with holding dignity for both sides, yet speaking truth to the pain that is caused from these fear-based, non-synodal approaches. It's got to stop. Thank you so much, Terry. I, I love, like, we should have had more of these conversations together when we were writing. I know it was all condensed into emails, but I very much relate to a lot of what you're saying is that, you know, the f wonderful formation that we received um, enabled us to, to, to weather the storm. And so when, so I didn't get one of these deals where it was like, okay, sign this, get the money and uh, be quiet. They either on purpose or by accident didn't silence me. <laughs> and so I'm like, oh wow, okay, I get the mic still. I'm gonna go ahead and go in front of every camera I can and tell my story because for eight years, I prepared kids and for confirmation RCA people to be priest, prophet, and ruler. And if if I have to believe, I have to believe what I've taught all these years. <laughs> Either that was all a sham and a thing that I just had to do, or I had to actually be, be it. And so, okay, how can I not then? How can I not see this as an opportunity? And yes, maybe ish, yeah, I was at an economic situation in my life where I could do this. Um, I was teaching at the Catholic College, uh, Intro to Bible and Intro Theology. So it was another full-time job over top of my pastoral associate full-time job that I could lean on. Um, and so I used that uh, privilege, blessing, to be able to be prophetic. Um, I think the story may be different if, if I didn't have as many supports, but I think fundamentally, I, I actually believed what I taught all these years in catechism. <laughs> And so how could I not speak, not speak? And, and in doing that, I found myself along this long tradition of folks on the margin, of founders of religious communities that were at first rejected, of the reformers in the Protestant Reformation, of all of the people who've been hurt and scarred uh, in the 2000 year history of the church. And I, there I found, as Terry said, the story, <laughs> the real, the, the story, and I lived it. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's, thank you, Terry, for sparking that insight. Everything that's been said in, in our renewal of baptismal vows, we have this phrase about, you know, we are part of a church that is a community of saints and sinners, right? And this experience that is so well documented in this book and, you know, in so many people's lives um, just reflects that, you know, and how we can be both at the same time and how of the folks we interact with. Um, is is does someone else want to have one last question before we have to wrap up this conversation which could go on is there anyone else who'd like to share anything yeah patrick, patrick please you're looking for the unmute button huh uh should be there the we little go like, yes. there you go 
Yay. Yeah, I'm I use I'm using my phone and I typically don't use my phone for Zoom. Um my name is Patrick. Um I live in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Uh and I am uh uh happily unmarried but together with my partner for over 30 years. And in my rather conservative parish in the Valley of Los Angeles, St. John Baptist of LaSalle, I have had the opportunity for a, a couple of decades now to serve in the parish as the, um, uh, what do they call me? Uh, I am the lector ministry coordinator. Uh, and my partner, Tony, uh, who's a beautiful man and I love and adore um, and has been a grace in my life, serves in our parish as the cantor. And so both of us have leadership roles within our parish that have been established through the um, a relationship, I guess, with the former Monsignor and pastor. He is now retired and there's been a transition of leadership uh, over the past five years. And They've maintained us in these leadership roles. Um, and that's the blessing. I, I am so impressed and, um, and thanks and thankful for the courage that I'm hearing from the people here in this meeting. And it helps me to be courageous because we live as uh, was said earlier, in a messy kind of world, it is a mystery why and how grace and sin can operate in the same room. And that's the situation that we find ourselves uh, in the church. And that's the situation I find myself working in this parish. Um, everyone knows that Tony and I are a gay couple, but no one is explicitly verbal about that, nor has our relationship been lifted up in any way uh, and made public within the community. That's partly my fault because I'm scared and I don't exactly know how to best make our relationship of love um, public within our parish because I think God's grace would work wonderfully through that explicit public acknowledgement of our relationship. But at the same time, which is permeates within the Catholic Church and within culture, is this don't ask, don't tell and that holds us back and it's out of fear. Um, so I just wanted to kind of share that um, with you. That's kind of the situation we find ourselves in. Um, I am committed and so is Tony. First of all, the community, that is the people of God know the situation. They're not stupid, right? And so we do get um, support from them in a non-public way, more in a, you know, spiritual kind of way. Um, uh, but we will continue doing what we do, uh, exercising leadership. I'm not shy. Whenever I teach, which I have the opportunity of doing quite often, I'm also the, the Virtus certified teacher at our parish. <laughs> And the first thing I say to them is I acknowledge the fact that I am gay and that I'm in this relationship. I have to be public and honest in order to be authentic and true to the people. So in a small in the smaller context, I'm open about it. But in a large public context, I'm, I feel silenced. But we'll continue, Tony and I, serving the church until the day they fire us. That's what I always say. And I will continue doing this until the church kicks me out. And so far, they haven't kicked me out. So praise be to God for that. So thank you. Yay. Thank you so much for sharing your your testimony, your witness, and your service, your life. Um, 
you know, I think back to the the organization that grew up around Reverend Janie Spar <laughs> back in the eighties that all may freely serve, right? You know, and that what Christ wants for us is abundant life, which you know to me includes that sense of being able to be who we fully are openly have that affirmed and um this conversation just has touched into so many of the points related to that please if you do not have cornerstones you want it on your bookshelf and in your hands open just the way we want pope francis reading it and absorbing it <laughs> it so this book is available either at amazon.com or through new ways ministry it's advertised on their website the instructions for ordering it are very simple um order an extra copy for folks that might need it <laughs> um it's it's really this is such an important conversation in terms of just the overall justice in terms of the power structure of our church in in terms of how following vocation is important in people's lives but truncated unjustly for so many people um terry ish mark thank you so much for being here to spark this conversation tonight for your witness um for the book um for all of those who contributed to the book and and all the efforts behind it um this conversation will continue <laughs> um but thank you if there if you have any closing remarks uh please feel yeah, free. I and... wanted to also offer some words of thanks, uh, Marianne, for, for hosting this and for Dini USA for um, uh, allowing for this event to happen. I just wanted to share with everyone that I had the privilege of meeting Marianne for the first time in person in Rome uh, over a year ago. And when I met her, I, I knew her reputation. <laughs> and so I was like, there, there is a person of courage willing to to cross the boundaries because of other people who've gone before her because of the faith that she's received and so patrick i you know i i am so grateful for the holy spirit stirring in your heart the desire to you know to be even more out than you already are because you may never know the lives that you will save or touch and the holy spirit and grace working through you to reach out to them to be free to be full, to be alive, and to be who they are. So I thank you, Marianne, again for this and all of you for the time this evening for coming out.